So it's 2 p.m. Central European time. I guess it's time to start. So welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you're watching on the world right now. Today we have the webinar dealing with an introduction to electronic schooling. Before we jump into the topic, let me just quickly show you the agenda for today. So I'll first introduce myself and introduce SimScale per se. Then we'll quickly or briefly talk about the LinkedIn questionnaire results that are published on LinkedIn so that you also know who's actually participating in this webinar. Next, we'll have a sneak peek, which demo we are going to have a look at today. Then we'll talk about a very important aspect, which are challenges in electronics design. I'll talk about simulation in general, why simulation is necessary and why you need it. Then we'll quickly delve into the fascinating field of the basics of electronic schooling. So what heat transfer mechanisms there are and why they are important and how they work. Then we'll talk about big misconceptions about electronic cooling in general, had best practices, and then I'll show you the demo case. And if we have time at the end, we'll have a brief Q&A session. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'm trying to answer everything at the end. Please note that this is not a um, conventional webinar. I'm doing it a little bit different. So I'll show you the results of the demo case. We'll quickly jump into the workbench and show you how I set it up instead of clicking around and showing you how it works. And I'll deliver a video, a separate video on our YouTube channel where you can see everything step-by-step step and explained in every detailed manner. So introduction to myself, my name is Yusuf. I'm the Community and Academic Program Manager at SimScale, work for SimScale for a bit more than four years now. And I specialized in simulation and on the side, I'm working on my thesis dealing with geometric deep learning. And currently I'm responsible for product marketing at SimScale. And if you have any questions in the meantime, you can reach out to me via LinkedIn or Twitter. So who is SimScale? Um, SimScale was founded in 2012 in Munich, and we are currently an international team with a bit more than 90 employees. And we built the world's first cloud-based simulation technology. And that can be seen on this slide. So what you can do is you can solve CFD, FEA, or thermodynamic problem in your browser. And everything you need is basically a machine and a decent internet connection. Let us jump briefly to the LinkedIn questionnaire results so that you also know who you are dealing with today. So as you can see, the distribution looks uh, as follows. We have 56% academic, so that includes researchers and students. We have 40% professionals, which is really exciting, although this is an introduction to electronic schooling, and the rest are hobbyists. So welcome to all of you. And this webinar is really about you, the audience. So I included everything uh, that follows on the slides um, to make sure this covers as much as possible. So you can see this kind of bell, sh bell curve shaped distribution right here, where I asked um, who is an expert and who is a beginner. And you can see most of the people participating in the webinar are uh, level three, so intermediate experience in simulation. The last question that I asked was, uh, what's the most important consideration when working with a tool? And uh, the majority answered that accuracy is very important, followed by minimal work required for pre-processing. So that also includes, or especially includes um, CAD optimization. Then we have accessibility of the tool. And then last but not least, the pricing. And uh, there was a specific purpose for asking this because everything that you answered in this survey or in this questionnaire will be discussed in today's webinar. So stay tuned. Quick sneak peek for today's application. We'll have a look at thermal management with forced convection. We'll have a specific look at what you can change. So I've prepared two case studies for you. Not only what um, the, the fan size actually uh, changes in terms of simulation or the velocity or the heat distribution, but also how the fin type can change the behavior of your system. So stay tuned for that. Let us quickly jump to the Internet of Things, which you can see right here. So you often hear by IoT, which is um, a very well-known term in the industry. And simply put, this is basically a concept of connecting any device with an on and off switch to the internet. So this includes everything from your cell phone, headphones, lamps, or wearable devices you have, and almost anything else you can think of. And the demand for new products with enhanced performance is fueling the efforts of companies to basically continuously innovate and shorten the time to market. So on top of that, uh, products are also 
products are also getting smarter while at the same time getting smaller, uh, which creates the, uh, the challenge in terms of integrating sensors, for example, in locations where they haven't been used before. So for example, if you think about smart homes. So a big challenge in electronic design, of course, is overheating. And uh, overheating can result in melting of the components, as you can see right here, or so-called delamination. However, the big challenge is that you don't see an immediately failure of your components, but a degradation over time. And that happens uh, due to continuous stresses, so current is flowing through your components, and then you have thermal expansions, which causes stresses in your components. And this is often the case if you have packaging-related problems, and packaging is another term for enclosure of electronics devices. And just as a side note, um, if we are, for example, talking about LEDs in particular, just a few degrees lower in temperature at the LED chip can mean thousands of hours of extended life. So sim using simulation in the early stages of your design is re really crucial. So one thing that I want to mention, of course, and it's very brief, is Moore's law. Some of you might know it, which basically says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles every two years. Some people say 18 months. However, some people or experts also say that the, the end of Moore's law is approaching. The Moore's, Moore's law in general, or the, the speed of the transistors we use, or the processors we use, um, is not really working in our favor, whether it's an engineer or designer. And although plenty of people say, as I said, the law is not valid anymore, we cannot stop the speed of, of, of processors in general, which is closely related to uh, a term called FLOPS, so which is floating point operations per second. So everything will become faster, smaller, more intelligent. And this is really a challenge. And what used to be, quote unquote, only metal is really becoming smarter and uh, more intelligent, as I already mentioned. But this also puts a very big challenge in front of, uh, of the engineer or designer per se. Let us talk about the challenges in electronic design. And I'll go a little bit in more into depth uh, on later at a later point. So one thing, of course, is performance. And this is closely related to the sizing of your components. So on the right-hand side, you can see um, thermal packaging or battery packaging. And uh, performance is influenced by the sizing, which of course influences the cost because the, the, more, the more you over-engineer things, the more costly they become. It becomes more harder to, uh, to scale things, basically. And also um, the lifespan is basically closely related to that. So um, we talked about the degradation over time. So we have to make sure that the customer is satisfied over a long period of time with our product. And maybe to mention a small anecdote, um, when I was at uni, there was uh, one guy from a famous automotive company from Germany uh, where they talked about electric vehicles. And there's still a big demand of thermal engineers uh, solving problems uh, in that area, especially in terms of batteries, electronic, um, electro electric vehicles to actually get rid of the heat in the batteries. So on this slide, you can see the following. Let me quickly explain what this means. So one of the things that could happen when we use traditional methods, like let's say we use um, prototyping, is that engineers or myself or yourself could simply over-engineer a component to avoid possible damage or overheating, as we mentioned. This is not very efficient on one hand because of the space we have, so the installation space, this is also tightly coupled to the costs of the materials, but also the scalability. And as you have seen uh, on the slide, it says simulation to deliver faster. But is it only about delivering faster? Not really. It's about delivering better product faster. Additionally, um, high complexity products, which you might see on the, on the right side, um, save more time and money actually compared to low complexity products. And once you integrate simulation in your thermal design, you save time and money, which you can see right here, um, which you would otherwise leave on the table. So why do we need simulation? Let me illustrate this on this slide. So one of the biggest challenges is uh, that product design cycles need to get shorter and shorter, uh, either because we have an increased number of products and we want to have them fast on the market. During the concept phase, which you can see on the x-axis, along with the product development phase, you and potentially your team of engineers or designers, you need a reliable, fast, and easy to use, and some, something which is very crucial, also an accurate tool to help to see the problems and identify them in the early stage. 
And the big downside, however, is that the cost of the changes increases with each step from concept to production. That means the closer you get to re the realization of the product, the more expensive it becomes to actually make changes. This is why we need to front load simulation. And what this means is that we basically use IT solutions like SimScale to examine designs during the design phase, and which is also part of the product development phase, where speed is essential. And by iterating rapidly, engineers can discount the less attractive ideas and innovate more. And once you have explored a design that is viable, you can continue to the next stage, either implementation phase, and then of course to the validation phase. So let me quickly talk about the uh, simulation steps involved. So we have a real world problem that can be whatever you can think of right now. And this real world problem is described by partial differential equations here written as PDEs. These are then implemented into our solver, which um, are al algebraic equations and which we then translate into code. We can basically take the algebraic equations in code together and say, this is our tool. And this tool spits out some data. And these generated data can then be visualized in our post-processor. And this is actually the point where we're trying to make sense out of this huge amount of numbers that our solver has generated. The good news is that you don't need to deal with any coding or equations, but you can um, set up your design, simulate it, and then make sure to interpret the data and see if your design is really valuable. To really emphasize this, I have put the famous Navier-Stokes equations on this slide. I'm not, not to scare you, but just to show you that these equations are very complicated and it's really helpful to have tools which don't need to need you to understand these formulas in a very detailed manner, but you have the tools already available and you can use them for your own purposes without dealing with a bunch of number crunching. And what we are solving when using SimScale, especially for electronics devices, is the so-called CHT solver. And CHT stands for conjugate heat transfer. So what you might have noticed, um, if you're already a bit familiar with the platform, is that we have two solvers, so CHT and CHTv2. And let me quickly explain what CHT means or what it actually does. So we basically have heat transfer within and between solid and fluid domains by exchanging thermal energy at the interfaces between them. However, if you might ask yourself, okay, what's now the difference between version one and version two? The thing is that the new algorithm solves an additional equation, which is not on the slide, which is the energy equation. This calculates the temperature in the solid and fluid region, however, in the same loop for all parts, which tre tremendously speeds up convergence, often within a couple of hundreds of iterations, which allows for more efficient parallel computation. So if we take two same cases and would simulate them with CHT and CHTv2, I can guarantee you that the CHTv2 solver is way faster and converges way faster. And to also integrate a uh, little joke right here. You can see that computational fluid dynamics is often abbreviated by CFD. And some people often make a joke that it also stands for colors for directors. And what this really means is that you can produce a lot of colorful pictures, but as I mentioned the slide uh, on the slide before, to really make sense out of the data and interpret them in the right way, this is really crucial. But I come to that at a later point. So you can use SimScale not only to visualize your model, you can make CAD modifications but please take note here, SimScale is not a modeling tool, but we have the capabilities to be one. And I will show you later on in the demo, um, if we have the time, um, what this actually means and what CAD operations you have available on our platform. And you can set up the simulation in the browser directly. You can share results in a very easy manner with your colleagues or, or friends, and you can analyze the results on the fly. That means once you uh, run your simulation and they have been finished or even before they have finished, you can post-process them inside of your browser in the post-processor. And of course, as always, you can, you can check the progress or the status of your simulation. A very crucial aspect though, is you can run multiple simulation, which you can see in the middle. And that means is that you can basically start as many runs as you want, and they all run in parallel, and you're not feeling any slowdown of your machine. And uh, if some of you are familiar, with simulation and you use traditional tools, which you have to, ins to install on your machine, you know that, for example, I remember when I was in uni and used 
tools like these. Once you run a simulation, you basically have to wait until the simulation stops because in the meantime, you cannot really do anything else besides running the simulation on your machine, especially if it's not very powerful. So on this slide, you can see uh, why Cloud CFD is so well suited for EC applications. So you can have a variety of different parameters which you can take into account for your cooling strategies. In the first column, you can see we can, for example, vary the heatsink design. That can be plate fins or pin fins, for example. You can change the material basically by one click. You just assign another material to it. You can take into account active cooling. That means you can just use fans of different sizes which is really convenient, and you can optimize um, the convective flow behavior. And of course, you can also change the, the CAT itself, like the, the casing itself, to see how big the pressure drop, for example, would be, which then also is um, highly coupled to the energy consumption. And everything I said is basically summarized in this small table right here. Let us focus on the last column, and when we have a look at the first row in the last column, so number of design iterations, for physical testing, it's often a few prototypes. And cloud simulation is basically unlimited. You can run multiple designs in parallel, as I mentioned earlier on. And um, But don't get me wrong. So uh, this doesn't mean that physical testing will be obsolete. But tools like these, especially SimScale, are meant to also complement each other. So Physical testing would probably, in my own opinion, would not, probably not be obsolete in the future, but one complements the other. But simulation is very a crucial aspect in your design phase or early stage of your design phase. Turnaround times is, as you can see, hours for all iterations, which in comparison to physical testing really takes days or even weeks for each iteration itself. And to also cover costs, as I promised earlier on in the questionnaire, you can see that cloud simulation is very cheap as compared, of course, to physical testing, which takes you a couple of hundred, if not thousands of dollars for each iteration. What I like to think of uh, as SimScale is that we are kind of a safety net for our users. So what does it mean? In case you have any problems, we have the forum available where you can ask your questions. We have, of course, the live support with, uh, where my colleagues are very happy to help you out in case you run into trouble with your project. We have the knowledge base, which is something you can find in our documentation. So let's say you are not sure what the CH solver actually does or what it is capable of, feel free to have a look into our documentation and you can find almost everything there. If not, feel free to reach out to me and I'll make sure that we um, create new knowledge base articles in the future. As I mentioned, we have modeling capabilities, which I'll show you later on. And um, if you are willing to buy a license, we also offer customized onboarding. That means, for example, showing you a demo, taking your case, and um, really taking you to the next level with simulation. So now the basics of electronics cooling, which is very interesting. So what you can see, uh, see here are the basic heat transfer methods. So we have on one hand conduction, convection, and radiation. So let me quickly walk through these three heat transfer mechanisms, and I'll explain each of them. So conduction means that heat is basically transported through a solid object, and this is covered by the so-called Fourier's law, um, which you can see also in this nice illustration. So we have a so solid object, and heat is transported through this object. Next, we have convection, which is heat transport from a solid to liquid or gas. And last but not least, we have radiation, where we have heat transfer from one body to another by propagation, uh, propagation through a medium which is in this case air. Or we can also say that this is um, moving from a high temperature surface to a lower temperature surface. Don't be too overwhelmed by this slide. I'll explain what this means um, in a second. So a very important thing for engineers or designers, especially when dealing with electronics cooling or heating in general, is the first law of thermodynamics, which says that the change of internal energy is heat added minus work done by the system. And you might ask yourself, okay, what, how does this help me? Well, this means nothing else that then heat or energy cannot be uh, created or destroyed, only converted into other energy forms. How does this help you? Let us have a look at this beautiful animation, a post-processing animation of the GTX 1070 graphics card. As an example, as plenty of you already in the questionnaire mentioned that you want to have a look at GPU cooling. And um, how does the heating here work? for example, in, in a GPU. So you have a current 
and the current is flowing across the transistors, causing, causing them to switch on and off, on and off, on and off. So this in turn generates heat, which is conducted through the thermal interface material. And the thermal interface material is also known as TIM. And then through a vapor chamber, it, the heat will then be transported to the fins. And at the fins, um, if necessary, it is transported either by natural convection, but usually in a machine or in a computer or in a laptop, you usually have fans which transport um, the heat away. And don't get me wrong, the process of course doesn't stop here. So it's not only about only doing CFD and then you're good to go. Of course, when you're dealing with a GPU, you also have to deal with uh, mechanical tests. And of course, don't forget the software stack um, to really write the software to um, really prescribe when the uh, fans go on, uh, with which speed and so on. So this is also a crucial aspect. So big misconceptions about electronic schooling. I have prepared four for you. So one thing is um, that fans and heat sinks solve everything. This is a misconception because there's always a trade-off between space, costs, the energy consumption, as I mentioned, and additional implementation. So that means, let's say you add two more fans or three more fans, this is an additional implementation that could potentially fail. So the chances or the, the probability of failing increases. Point number two is uh, tools show no difference. What does it mean? This is also a misconception because I've shown you the Navier-Stokes equation. This is almost 200 years old and people have the misconception that just because the equations didn't change, the tools didn't change either. However, this is wrong. Also from, from my experience um, and with other tools I've worked um, at uni, for example, not only do a lot of tools look outdated, I mean, this is just a user experience perspective now, but also this is very crucial because um, sometimes it's not very easily integratable into the, your current workflow, either if you work in a company or even if you're a hobbyist or like a, an academic researcher, um, which is very crucial in my opinion. And sometimes these um, software stacks or software programs um, don't even support the basic functionalities. For example, the CAT capabilities that I mentioned earlier on. Another big misconception is um, that simulation is only for experts. Let me quickly explain what that means. For example, SimScale is a tool which clearly shows that uh, even beginners can use simulation for their professional purposes or if it's a hobby project. Um, and we have an integrated um, plugin from Onshape, which means that you can uh, model your CAD uh, on, on the Onshape platform and directly import all of your model iterations, if you want, seamlessly into the same project. That means you have your design, design iterations. For example, you move uh, one heatsink to another place or maybe choose um, another component or component placement to see how this affects your design. This can simply be done in Onshape and then, of course, you can simply, with a plugin, import everything into the platform. Hope that, hope that makes sense. Last but not least, um, a big misconception is also that simulation tools are expensive. A few, a few slides ago, you have seen that SimScale as a cloud-based simulation tool is very affordable. And the cool thing is that you only pay for what you use without spending thousands of dollars to even prove the added benefit of your hardware which you would usually do if you use traditional simulation tools. So you have to get like big workstations. And um, I mean, I also worked in companies who do that. And before you can even prove the added value of your workstations and the software per se, um, it really takes time. But also uh, the people using these tools, they need experience. And uh, with SimScale, I think this is very, well, I'm a big believer in that SimScale uh, democratizes this and makes, or has a tool or is a tool which is very accessible for everybody. So in one slide, I will now explain CAT best practices. Um, I've uh, taken this slide from my great colleague, Matt Bemis. And um, if you want to delve more into best practices for SimScale, you can find a video from Matt on our YouTube channel. Um, I think the title is Conjugate Heat Transfer Best Practices in SimScale. Um, but let me quickly walk through the four major points that I want to mention here. The thing is that um, complicated and sophisticated design, as you can see on the bottom, um, is often the case in electronic schooling components. Um, this also causes our CAD model usually to be very intricate. And what we can do are four steps to, to clean our CAD. What we can do, as you can see um, right here, 
is, for example, that you can take these buses, the row of buses right here, and model them as a block. And maybe um, if you have any heat generation, you can use, for example, the maximum heat uh, for, for the components, for example, the, which is also known um, as the junction temperature. What you also can do is to defeature unnecessary details. That means uh, you can remove small pins, for example, number imprints or on your board, um, which you can find, which causes unnecessary small cells in the vicinity. For example, if you mesh the, uh, especially if you mesh the geometry, this causes really unnecessary small cells in, the, in this area, which um, increases also the calculation time. Point number three is remove small bodies. And this basically means that you can remove small bodies which do not emit heat and you can basically remove them. What do I mean with point number four? Inlet and outlet extension. Uh, what you can see on this slide right here, we have the inlet right here and we have the outlet right here. And uh, what this extension helps us to do, usually this is not the case, so we just extended it manually. What this helps us for is basically a numerical reason. And um, this helps us once the flow enters here, this helps us to make the flow fully developed uh, as it's entering and exiting the simulation domain. And getting a uniform velocity profile along the inlet and outlet area helps us with the numerical convergence. We say, um, if you don't know what this means, it's just to get things more stable and we also get more accurate results. And what I want to demonstrate here quickly before we move to the next slide is that you can see that on our platform, you can use something called comets where streamlines, streamlines are being shooted into our domain. And you can identify, for example, dead zones, which you can see on, on the top corner right here, where it's not very uh, fresh air transported, as you can see. And also this area right here uh, at the bottom can be very critical. And what you can do is, for example, um, create a slice and see uh, if there are hotspots which you have to uh, identify and um, maybe adapt in your design. So basically visualizing the invisible. And because what's very hard is if you have an enclosure and let's say in a physical experiment, of course you can put sensors inside. Um, this also works, for example, with a vacuum cleaner. However, you have to make sure that this is non-intrusive, so not really disturbing the real flow behavior in the system. And to, if you ask me, this is also very complicated. So what you can do is just use CFD. You can look into the system and um, integrate, quote unquote, virtual sensors, if you want to call them like that. Talking about the demo case now. So this is our demo case with the following properties. We have a few chips, uh, capacitors on board, of, of course, the CPU with 30 watts. Uh, I think in the simulation, I even used 40 watts for the CPU with a plate, uh, plate fin, as you can see on top to get rid of the heat. We have the following cooling strategies uh, possible. We can either use forced convection. So we really will use um, fans here. This is also known as active cooling. So we actively cool our, our system. We can also um, use natural convection. This is also possible inside of SimScale. So um, we just don't use any fans, but we also have a natural convection boundary condition, which takes into account natural convection. We can uh, not yet, um, but it's also a possibility as a cooling strategy is to use fluid phase change. And we can also um, simulate liquid cooling on SimScale. Our setup looks like this. We have a fan inlet with a 20 degrees Celsius and we have the open outlet into the ambient. So this is the component again. And here we have the design constraints as well as design parameters. So for the design parameters, this is something I want um, to take a look at. So we can select different heat sinks. We can select different fans that can either be the size or the speed, um, which then translate into higher cooling, higher speed, which you can use. And what you can do in the inlet is um, technically just change the velocity of the inlet and keep the temperature the same. So we leave it at 20 degrees Celsius and use 10, 15 or 20 meter per second as the inlet. And of course, what we can also do in, in terms of our cooling strategy is not effective. Uh, then we can also replace our components. Design study number one shows you the following, where we change the fan sizing, as you can see right here. So our baseline design has a speed of 50 meter per second. Then we try one with 10 meter per second. And the last is 20 meter per second. 
and want to really see how this affects our design. And you can see that right here. So on top you see 50 meters per second, 20 meters per second, and 10 meters per second. And what's really crucial here is to see that you see the baseline design is even cooler um, at the heat sink than, for example, the 10 meter per second case. However, however, some components are a little bit, also a little bit hotter when uh, using 10 meters per second. And uh, what you can see here is that 20 meters per second gives you the lowest temperature, especially for the, uh, the overall temperature. But that actually doesn't mean that this might be the best solution. In this case, it is. But um, you also have to take into account the power consumption because once you increase the fan size, the speed, um, this also uh, correlates to the um, energy used for the system. The top view on the system looks as follows. It's basically just the uh, same as the last slide, but just from a top view. And you can see in the middle that 20 meters per second really gives us very good results. And this is something I would be happy with. On this slide, you can see the result summary for our case study. You see that the design with 15 meters per second, which is our baseline design, is at 50.4 degrees Celsius. And the one with 10 meters per second see is even hotter, so five, roughly 5 to 6% hotter. And we can even get this, um, if we go from 50 meters per second to 20 meters per second, we can get this down by uh, roughly 10% more from 50 down to 46 degrees Celsius. Okay, let's take a deep breath and let us jump to case study number two, where we vary the heat sink. So our baseline design was um, having a plate fin in place. And design number two shows the what happens if we use pin fins. And this really um, shows you how this affects the, the, the overall temperature, or also the, the velocity um, in our domain. So we jump quickly to the result summary if we change the uh, pin design. And as you can see, we can get down the temperature from 15.4 degrees Celsius, 16% down by using another design of the fins um, to four, roughly 42 degrees Celsius. Um, that would be basically it before we jump to the Q&A. Uh, it was rather quick and uh, quicker than I expected. Um, before we jump to the Q&A, let me switch my screen. Can you see my, what I wanted to show you because we have been, or I have been so quick today is uh, what you can see right here. This is basically how I imported uh, the model. Um, so let me just select this volume, for example. You can see this is our design. And uh, what you see is that these are our components. If I show everything, then this is the case. However, we imported it that way which is not very CFD ready. Uh, so what we have to do, what I'll show you right now, is you see the second thing that I did is we can open it in a region. So this is, for example, a CAT capability. This is something I talked about. Um, so this is something open in a region where we select um, seed faces, for example, uh, and, and an outer face. And then we can have something as our fluid domain, which is then created inside our domain, which you can see. and this. Um, bright blue color, this bluish color. If I remove the casing now, you can see that this is this blue color that uh, now was created or has been created from open inner region is something that was done inside of SynScale. So I don't have to go back to my tool. And this is basically my fluid domain, which I use later on. Don't worry too much about the imprint operation. This is uh, especially um, heat or loads in general between the interfaces. So imprint basically just makes the faces congruent. So this is just this. If you want to know more about imprint and open in the region, feel free to check out the documentation. And I'm happy to help you out if you have any additional questions regarding that. I also see that we have some questions coming in. How big is the uh, computational domain? How many cells? And how long did it take you to get to the solution converged? Let me see. So what you can see right here, this is a normal simulation that I did. Um, and as I said in the beginning, a tutorial will follow. So a step-by-step -step instruction, uh, instruction on how to set this up. You asked about the mesh. So what you can see is um, there's one mesh, which has 6.2 million cells and 1.7 million nodes. This is the one uh, which was used uh, in, this, in this case. This answers uh, your question here. 
Let us have a look at the simulation one because um, I think this is also a crucial aspect. You can see that when I go, let me quickly jump back. This is the normal conjugate heat um, transfer solver which was used. And you can see run one took 235 minutes, right? So let's keep this in mind, 235 minutes. And I jumped to something I created yesterday, which is the CHTV2 solver. This is one result I interrupted because I had a wrong setting. And you can see this is only 121 minutes. So you can see, um, you can of course do your own studies with the CHTV2 solver, but this is something which uh, also comes down to core consumption, which you can see right here. If you hover over this um, field, you can say, uh, you can see I consumed 130 core was here. And I've, I'm way faster by using the CHTV2 solver. As I mentioned, just everything is solved in the same loop with the energy equation. Um, we have one question. Are the comparisons with various fins involved the same input fan velocity? Yes, it was. It was the same velocity. What was the inlet velocity for K32? Uh, I'm quite sure it was uh, 15. Because if we go back, we see that we have uh, 50.4 degrees Celsius, right, with the plate fins. And we see 50.4 degrees Celsius also um, in case study one with 50 meter per second. I hope this answers your question. So it was 50 meter per second um, for both cases. Um, and you can really see the difference between these two. And of course, if you have any uh, additional questions, uh, maybe at the later point, you can always contact me via email, which you can see below. Why not uh, electronic schooling use the mobile devices? Um, thanks for the question. Um, I'm quite sure uh, engineers also use this for, for mobile devices. So any compact design uh, designs that you have, either smartphone or any other device that you wear with you, or even if it's like a smartwatch, um, I'm quite sure that engineers don't rely on estimations, but uh, rather on computational methods or simulation met methods in general to solve these kind of problems. Mm. I also have a question, is it possible to do topology optimization in this tool? Um, not yet, thanks for the question. Um, but um, we may have this maybe in the future. Um, I can't promise anything, of course, um, but stay tuned for any updates when it comes to topology optimization. But good question. Is the student version available for learning? Uh, if yes, what does it cost? Very good question, uh, let me answer that. And um, there's a student version available. So we have an academic license which costs nothing. So the only thing you have to do is write me an email at jmurat at simscale.com and I'll be happy to help you out. It might take maximum a week until I get back to you and because I get very uh, many emails regarding academic programs. Um, but yes, this is then free and the academic version has um, the option to create private projects, uh, increase the amount of course that you can choose from. Um, of course, not 96, 96 will also only be possible or 64 course would only be possible in the professional version, but up to 32 um, with the academic version. And if you are not eligible for the academic plan, I highly encourage you to create a community account, which you can then use for learning purposes, training purposes, um, or just to get a feeling on how this tool behaves. Um, of course, we're not charging you if you create an account, that's for sure. The community account is for free, so is the academic account. The only thing you would have to pay for is the professional license. But in case you want to get the professional license where we, where you get dedicated support from my colleagues um, and way more capabilities with the tool, also use tool, uh, our module, uh, the Lattice Boltzmann Solver, for example, for external aerodynamics or PWC, then this is the license to go for. I hope this answers your question. Mm, one asked is if this is um, cell-based code or node-based code. This is a good question. I'm not 100% sure, but I can certainly ask this, um, Ali. It's no, no problem at all. I can ask this for you and then you can write me an email and I can give you an answer that's 100% sure then. Oh, this is a good question. Should we take into account also the actual fan design? This is something we covered in the past uh, in some tutorials, um, which are unfortunately outdated. Um, and we're working on getting them back into the documentation. Yeah, working on the fan design is also a very crucial aspect. Uh, we, hold, we also had a webinar, I think two, two or three years ago, I think two years ago um, with a partner where we um, had different fan designs and really uh, had a look at how this um, influences the, the overall performance. So fan design is very crucial as well. Of course, it doesn't stop only in the board or just um, 
taking things and putting them into your mm, component. But it really depends on also what, what you're working on. I mean, if you buy the fence already, you don't have to do any optimization, right? And if you buy it from the shelf, quote unquote, then you can just use the fans. Um, you can also work with uh, pressure, a fan curve, um, if that's provided, it's also possible. Mm, yeah. How do you clean the geometry? Yeah, <clears throat> there's a good question. I mean, we have knowledge base articles in our documentation, which explain this in a bit, a bit more detail. Um, but I would recommend um, maybe using Onshape. Why Onshape? Um, this is integrated in our SimScale um, workbench already. So if you make any changes on your geometry or clean it with the tips I have given you um, in this webinar, you can simply import them into the workbench without having to download it, upload it again and so on, which is quite tedious if you ask me. So the plugin really has some added, added value here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, regarding the uh, cell-based uh, approach, um, we have a paper especially on the new solver, which also explains uh, how the equations are solved if you are really into sophisticated quote unquote mathematics. Um, I can send it to you if you want. So if anyone is interested in the paper, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to send you the uh, CHT V2 solver. And um, one question was, is if we used uh, what turbulence model we used and it's actually, we didn't use any, but what I would, it was only done with Lamina, like K Omega SST definitely makes sense here switch by one click to K Omega SST. I hope that answers your question. How can you model a fan with a curve and a, yeah, this um, fan curve can actually be modeled and then imported into the workbench. This is explained in, uh, I'm not sure how the documentation article is called, but this can definitely be done. If you want more information, feel free to reach out to me and I'll send you all the details. Yeah, and if you want the paper, um, just contact me and I'll get back to you. I'm waiting one more minute now. If there are no more questions from your side. Oh, this is also a good question. How would you simulate heat transfer on a radiator, for example, used in water cooling with airflow through it? I'm concerned about tiny holes in the radiator. This is possible. And actually for water cooling, I think, um, I think there was a webinar from my colleague, Darren Lynch, and he did something like this also to identify um, possible problems with pressure drop, especially in heat exchangers uh, or for radiators, I'm not 100% sure, but have a look at our YouTube channel. Um, feel free to write me an email and I'll send you the video to show which one it was. And there you can also see how he dealt with pressure drop, what design, design changes he made in order to overcome this. Glad that so many people attended today. Um, I hope that this was useful to you. And if you have any more questions or even feedback for me, um, please send me an email or contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, optimize the next or the upcoming webinars. We have more webinars for electronic schooling uh, coming in Q1. Um, yeah, if you have any questions or maybe wishes for um, upcoming webinars, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to get back to you. And uh, yes, you can simulate a cooling for Baja vehicles, that's possible, so yeah. Thanks for the question. And if you have any de detailed application for this, um, feel free to post your question in the forum um, and either the power users, my colleagues, or, or I will get back to you as soon as possible. I'm also available over the holidays, so feel free to contact me in case you need anything from my side. Also, if you're interested in the professional license, or licensing in general, um, I'm more than happy to help you out and I can then forward you to my colleagues from the sales team. I hope, I hope also that this uh, kind of different uh, webinar um, style of not showing, uh, just clicking around, but also um, just showing you the case and then delivering um, the step-by-step -step tutorial after the webinar, I think in my opinion makes more sense rather than showing you how to click um, something. Awesome. Then uh, with that being said, um, thank you so much for your feedback, guys. Uh, happy that so many attended. And I'll hopefully see you in the next webinar or maybe in the forum, let's see. Uh, I wish you all the best, uh, take care, stay safe, and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.